If you haven't seen the previous video in this series, follow the link on your screen or click the link in the description or pinned comment below. So you decided to send this particular movie on this particular month, eh? Stand aside, PB. I got this. I know you don't smoke weed. I know this. But I'm gonna get you high today. Cause it's Friday. Roll credits, and only 14 seconds in. That's early enough that you can probably roll some blunts too. I see we're trying to appear hip, appealing to the urban youth. You probably even call them that. Anyway, I've always thought the roll credits gag was pretty useless, but this one is special special. The movie is named after an extremely common word. It's about as stupid as sending a movie for being called her or it. The ability to see this far into the city, smog free in Los f***ing Angeles. Oh. Would you look at that? I'm seeing that far into the city in Los Angeles. Baby, get out of the fucking shot, dude. If Smokey is so concerned that someone might catch him smoking up in the privacy of his bedroom, then why did he leave a rolled joint out in the open while he slept? This nigga's name is Smokey. He is not concerned about anyone catching him. And you... Cringe Lord writing the subtitles. I said nigga. I am one, so I can say that. Nigga. Socks and slippers. Sounds about white. Black men don't do the whole shoes with no socks thing. In fact, we rarely go barefoot in the house. And another thing, these are called house shoes. Calling these slippers in South Central might get you slept. Is there a reason we have to pan all the way up Ice Cube's body? He's only 5'8", for Christ's sake. Shouldn't even take this long. Shut up, bitch. Good morning. Are you prepared for Jehovah's return? Solicitors. I see this is just going to be Jeremy pointing at random things and calling them sins, even if the movie shows that Jehovah's Witnesses are annoying. That's why you can't sin classics. You don't have much to call them out for, so you just make shit up. My mama told me if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. Motherfucker. Entering your sister's room without knocking first. Question, why the heck are you sending deleted scenes? You've done this one and the one with Smokey at the beginning. Oh, I guess you're giving me a convenient thing to point to when your dumbass audience comes here to say that deleted scenes don't count. I'd remove a sin for this, but you still have dumbass fans that come here to annoy me. Joy would kick your ass anyway. Joy ain't gonna do a goddamn thing. That's the truth. We have despair, anger, lust, avarice, posturing, and pain, but Joy definitely does not make an appearance in this movie. All that dumb shit aside, Joy is in this movie. You ain't got to lie, Jeremy. You ain't got to lie. But Future Birdman, the J on the word Joy was lowercase. This means Jeremy is actually saying there is no joy in watching this movie, and for that kind of bullshit, he might just make me code switch. Also, who stores cereal with the front of the box facing out? Them sh should be filed vertically, where you can determine the type by the spine of the box. Oh, is that why the cereal aisle displays cereal this way? Because filing them vertically makes more sense? And if your retort is that it saves space, that depends, but you would think grocery stores of all places could benefit from the extra space. How did Craig not notice the milk was almost empty when he picked it up? You realize you're taking a gag in a comedy movie seriously, right? I mean, who the hell takes comedy seriously enough to make a YouTube video about- What are you doing? I'm throwing this away. We ain't even got no milk. First off, you did have some milk. And furthermore, it's a sugar-based cereal. Pop those sweet treats into your mouth and quit complaining. You see this big-ass bowl? No, he did not have some milk. That's like telling a person dying of thirst a drop of water is some water. And seriously, nobody is eating that dry ass cereal without any milk, dude. Have you ever eaten Captain Crunch? Even with milk, that shit destroys the roof of your mouth. You know what your problem is? You think money grows on trees. 
And you know what every movie parent's problem is? None of them can come up with anything more interesting to say than you think money grows on trees when scolding their kids. And then this bleeds into real life, and now all of us say it when we become parents. Human sacrifice! Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Jeremy makes a Ghostbusters pop culture reference that isn't a sim- Also, this monologue from John Witherspoon's character is pretty f***ing hilarious. I have to say. But it also goes on for all the some time. And there's no f***ing way that a rebellious young adult would stick around for the entirety of it. I was gonna let PB go all, Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. But then I realized you just suggested a black child would walk away from his parent while they were talking. Fam, we don't do this no matter how grown we get. Unless of course you want the black snatched off your ass. You need a wig. You need a job. Both may be true, but they certainly have nothing to do with each other. Nobody said they did. It's called a roast session. The point is to one-up the other, and telling Craig he needs a job basically ended his life. That, I mean, the conversation. When we saw Craig's dad in the previous scene, he was dressed for work. Since this is still the same morning, why is he now out of his clothes? What amount of damage could he possibly be doing in the bathroom to where he would need to disrobe completely? Pops was wearing a jumpsuit, which means he has to take it off near completely to take a dump. Women that wear rompers know this pain all too well. Also, when he does walk in, Craig shuts the door. If Dad is this open about his bodily functions, why wouldn't he want everyone to see, hear, and smell? Probably because the other two people are the women of the house. I don't know about you, but I'm not about to have my dick out in front of my daughter. So begins a weird recurring bit involving breaking the fourth wall in this movie, in which nothing else indicates that it's warranted. Since when is breaking the fourth wall warranted? Like, in any movie, ever. It's only done to make something funny or unsettling. Hell, even Deadpool didn't start breaking the fourth wall until Joe Kelly. I'm trying to get with her, but Dan won't even hook me up. So not only is Craig asking his sister to help him get laid, he's now complaining to his mother that Dana won't assist him in his sexual endeavors. This family is way too tight, in a very weird way. There is a significant culture difference happening here. First, you say Craig should have walked away from his father when speaking. Then you say this family is too tight. What's next? You're going to tell us Mrs. Jones put too much seasoning on those pork chops or that there's a noticeable lack of mayonnaise jars around this house? I I don't know what white people eat. I just assume mayonnaise is everywhere. With what? You ain't got nothing, man. With this. Pointing a weapon in someone's face in jest. That's how we say hello in South Central. If you've never pulled a 45 on your boy, can you say that y'all are even friends? You got to be a stupid mother to get five on your day off. Smokey's statement is often quoted by fans of the film. I guess it's kind of funny, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. Craig got fired because he was caught on tape stealing something and not necessarily on his day off. And let me stop you right there, because that's exactly the point. Nobody gets fired on their day off. Bosses are assholes that wait until you've already driven to work, clocked in, and are about five hours into your shift before calling you in the office. Besides, aren't you sending the extended version of this movie? In the beginning of this version, it's shown that Ezel was the one that was stealing the boxes. You ain't got no job, and you ain't got to do. I know Smokey's not the most reliable source of wisdom, but this asshole just told Craig he should go down to the health club to look for a job. Seconds later, he's telling him that he should get f***ed up instead. I'm just saying you'd think a guy with a name like Smokey would be a little more responsible with his messaging. But the whole point is that Smokey thinks Craig, like himself, can get high and still be high-functioning. This is why later in the movie, Smokey chides Craig for not being able to handle his high. Also sending this line, for literally any reason at all. There are way more abusive parents jokes in this movie than I will ever be comfortable with. To be fair, I'm pretty sure I'm only comfortable with zero, and they crossed that line seven or eight jokes ago. There is a significant culture difference happening here. Look, I'm not about to make a case that we should be whooping our kids' asses, but I will say that we don't end up on Dr. Phil crying, wondering why our kids won't behave in Walmart. In large numbers, anyway. The f*** was that? She was angry that they slammed her door? I mean, if you didn't cut off half the damn scene, you'd know that. Name the state Stop slamming my goddamn oh, door! Sorry, Lori, time's sorry, up. Joanne. All you do is smoke weed. The thesis statement for this movie. Look, I generally love it and find it hilarious. But when you get down to it, this plot is as paper thin as an episode of Caillou. My guy, this movie is called Friday. It's literally saying, here's what happened on the day before the weekend. It's not a Martin Scorsese flick. Nobody is here for the plot. We're here to laugh. 
Awesome! The one thing we were missing in this mid-90s classic is some casual racism against Asian Americans. Glad I can check that off the list. Now I need protagonist finds love while dumping all over his current girlfriend. Best friend inadvertently implicates protagonist in wacky adventure. And nonchalant misogyny to fill out the full bingo card. You have to understand the timing of this film's creation. This movie was made in the wake of the killing of Latasha Harlins, a 15-year-old girl that was killed by a Korean liquor store owner in Los Angeles. At that time, the situation between Asians and black Americans was pretty tense, especially because the bitch that killed Latasha got off with a slap on the wrist, even though she was found guilty of manslaughter. That event was a major reason for the Los Angeles riots. Frankly, this movie went hella easy on the Korean liquor store owner stereotype, all things considered. If you want to see the extreme of this, watch Menace to Society. I bet you won't touch that one. No one will be seated while the movie- I'm not about to sit here and let this man send the Miss Parker scene. Fuck that noise. Then maybe dish the flannel. You're not in Seattle, and that would still be a couple years past its prime even if you were. Sinning 90s Los Angeles fashion. If you see what these weirdo kids wear today, you'd be wishing we went back to this style. Wow, that's a pretty good MJ impression. I'm sure Chris Tucker doesn't want to show it too often, though, so we'll probably never see him use it later in his career. Chris Tucker was given this role almost entirely due to his Michael Jackson routine. You're probably unaware of this, but Chris was a comedian on Def Comedy Jam, and this was one of his best bits. That and the roach with the stitches. My roach is smart, too, man. They play dead. The other day, I stepped on one of them, went in the bathroom to get some tissue, came back, that nigga was gone. I seen him two weeks later with some stitches. <laughs> Nigga told me he was too legit to quit. What we call drugs is something Full Street Baptist Church. We call a sinny sin sin. Bernie Mac would have been the sinny sinniest at cinema sense. Let it be known that Jeremy just admitted to being against marijuana. Around here, between Norman and Weston, we call this here a little twin and twin twin. Wow. Mega. Look, look, she bending over. I know there was precious little internet porn in 1995, but they did still have porno magazines. My point is that Craig has many more options to get his rocks off than I f***ing the milk next door. Let it be known that Jeremy thinks porn magazines are better than hot, real-life women with big asses. I ain't trying to get involved with y'all. You gonna get involved, I'm gonna knock your ass out too. Considering they know Debo's up to no good when he pulls up, why didn't they just go inside the house? It would have been quicker than hiding all their expensive anyway. Let it be known that Jeremy is definitely one of them dudes that crosses the street. Let me let you in on a little secret. We can cross the street too. Craig. Bye, Felicia. This term is so interwoven into our culture that I wouldn't be surprised if 2020 Ice Cube terminated himself back to 1995 and purposely put it in this movie so that he'd get the credit. Sinning by Felicia. That's worth these many sins. You smoking my weed too? Oh yes, that common side effect of smoking marijuana, the immediate visual hallucinations. This is the movie showing what it looks like for a first timer. Now, I've never done a drug in my life, but I'm sure if I did, I'd see Big Worm's weak ass perm in my cupboard too. How's Craig's house, the ground zero for all the happenings of this neighborhood? Debo pulls in here when he could take his bike anywhere. Debbie comes over even though she knows Dane is still at school. The pastor shows up. The horny lady across the street is being horny across the street. And out of all the places this ice cream truck could stop, it's right outside Craig's magical house of wonders. Debo shows up at Craig's house because he's trying to burgle Stanley's house, which is next door. Debbie visits because she doesn't know Dana isn't there yet. The pastor is here to hit on Craig's mother, but ends up smashing Mrs. Parker instead. And Big Perm is here to chastise Smokey. For all the whining about this movie not having a plot, you sure are having a difficult time following it. You saw that bud? That's old son of Having this conversation in front of all the neighborhood kids in the middle of the day. What kind of magical place are you from where drug dealers give a shit about kids? And don't give me that weird white shit. I know you've seen Breaking Bad. Who is that bitch? Don't all the characters in this movie live in the same neighborhood? Seems like everyone knows everyone around here. And Debbie's a popular lady, so how the hell does Joy not know who she is? For that exact reason, Joy does not live around here. Damn, son, do you think all black people know each other? Let me get LeBron in a video real quick. I mean, we're both in L.A. and all. What you gonna do? Number one, number two. Number two. 
The movie is so concerned with sh** that I'm concerned a Golgothan's gonna make an appearance in the next 10 minutes. Jeremy makes a dogma pop culture reference. You walk up and down the street all day playing. Main character gives a speech to try and set his childish friends straight in a 90s comedy cliche. Yeah, but since the main character is the one doing it, this ain't that cliche. But you live. You live to fight another day. What about this cartoonish character would indicate he's capable of giving actual fatherly advice? This tone shift at this point in the movie is so sudden I feel like I've been penetrated with no Vaseline. Cringe. Also, this moment is Willie finding out his son owns a gun. You aren't a real father if you can't put the bullshit aside and teach your son that shooting is for pussies. Uh, what Future Birdman is trying to say is that gun violence is a big problem in our community, and this is the movie showing how having a father figure could mitigate this issue. Oh, you are. Oh, that's cool. Damn! Even if you haven't watched this movie before, you've watched this movie if you spent more than two cumulative hours scrolling on Twitter. Sinning this scene. That's worth these many sins. Janet Jackson! The girl Debbie hooked me up with. Ha 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 ha! She's not incredibly attractive and slightly overweight. Isn't that hilarious and super unexpected? Ha 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 ha! Slightly overweight. Slightly. I really hate to speak ill of the dead, but this woman was lying when she said she looked like Janet. I would have said lying her ass off, but nope, that's still there too. For a young slacker with no job, Craig's room sure is clean. Everything's neatly laid out, the laundry's in the hoop hamper, and his bed is even pretty much made. We've reached the point that CinemaSins has nothing to actually bitch about, so they've resorted to pointing out how clean Craig's room is. On that note, where are you getting that Craig is the slacker? Smokey is the slacker. Craig is the straight man. If you're going to call yourself Cinema Sins, you might want to take a community college course on cinema. Worms on a f***ing van and guys with machine guns to take out Craig and Smokey? Over two hundred f***ing dollars? It's not the money, it's the principle of the whole thing. It's principalities in this. Family, what's going on? Open machine gun fire from a couple of minutes ago is just now bringing the neighbors out of their houses to see what happened. Are you... Seriously suggesting people should have come out of their homes to investigate a drive-by? What? You lucky I'm not a man, otherwise I kick your ass myself. Nia Long is super badass in this scene, which makes it all the more unfortunate that she still needs Craig to save her in the end. The movie had a chance to move in a bold direction, but chose to go the route of the night in flannel armor. And what the entire fuck did you expect 90s Nia Long to do to Prime Debo? Nigga, this ain't the Avengers and that ain't Black Widow. What time are you waking up in the morning? 8.30, why? I'm more wondering why you're getting up that early. You don't have a job, Craig, man. You just got a little bit of your ass handed to you. I'm pretty sure Craig won that fight. You can't get your ass handed to you if you were the one handing out ass. All right, that didn't come out right. Oh yeah, your supervisor called you today about your job. She wants you to call it tomorrow. So glad we wrapped up that storyline that I was not invested in even a little. Again, CinemaSins is sending the director's cut of this movie. This was not in the theatrical version and almost no one has even seen this scene. I'm sure there are people watching this that didn't even know this scene existed. My point is that Jeremy is essentially shitting on something that doesn't exist as a part of the movie's lore for all intents and purposes. Use your brain. That's what I want you to do. Use your brain. Yes, you really outthought that dude when you chucked a brick at his head after he choked you out, then repeatedly punched and kicked him when he was on the ground. Excellent thinking skills, sport! And if he'd shot him, he'd either be in prison or worse. I'd say that's using your brain, something that seems to be a foreign concept amongst people at CinemaSins HQ, which of course explains why you don't get it. And if this is how you're going to approach black movies, don't bother. Because if you discover Meteor Man, I'm gonna have to tell Big Worm you stole his bread.